Hello, welcome and kumusta and thank you for joining me. This is how I am your occupational therapist and welcome to OT Conversations. In this episode, I would like to talk to you about the four process or the four phase of occupational therapy process that I have come up with and I can't believe after all of these episodes I have not talk about this so here we go there are four phases that are important with regard to occupational therapy process and the first phase being the assessment phase the next important phase is the phase of problem identification and goal setting the third phase being the intervention and the treatment phase And then the last phase, which is the fourth phase, would be the discharge phase of your OT process. And we're going to talk about all of these different phases. So the phase one is assessment. Now, just going back a few steps. There are, there's an OT process that is very popular, which obtains, which comes from referral process. And then you'll get data gathering and then the assessment and things like that. So that's very popular. That's very well used. And that's obviously very common and very popular. And a lot of people are going with that. Now, this is a different type. This is mine. Again, this is with the understanding that the referral has taken place. This is with the understanding that you know what the condition is. So with this, you have an understanding that you already know who the client is. You already know what the conditions are. You've done all of your pre- preliminary check. Soon as you got it and you're opening up the case, then you will either be doing assessment, you're going to be doing problem identification and goal and discharge, problem identification and goal setting. You will be doing an intervention and then you will be discharging the case. So the first phase would be the assessment phase. So what is the assessment phase? In the assessment phase, as an occupational therapist, you should remember that your concern as an occupational therapist is always about the human occupation. So it is obvious that you need to establish what their occupational history is, what their pre-morbid functioning is, and you need to establish their roles, their habits, and their routine. Now, how do you do that? The first one is when you go and see the person, you obviously need to establish your rapport. So when you go and see the person, the first thing is you have to know this person. What do they do? Who do they live with? Do they still work? What are their interests? What are their jobs? So the social history is very important. So know the person. How do you establish that? Yeah. So what are their jobs? Do they still work? Are they retired? Do they live with their wife? Do they have children? Do they have family? Yeah. So that's one part of it. The other thing that you need to do is I would recommend you establish uh, how do they deal with their community mobility? Do they drive a car? Who does their shopping? Who does the cooking? Yeah. All of these things are important because if you do that, if you're able to establish that they drive a car or they do their uh, their own shopping, they do their own community mobility, they do their own cooking, it's giving you an idea of the bigger perspective and it's giving you an idea of the control of the person that he can or she can influence the environment. That's through occupational history. Uh, Find out their patterns and routines. Uh, When do they have their breakfast? Uh, When do they have their lunch? Uh, Do they have uh, hot meals only in the afternoon or at nighttime? Things like that. What do they normally have for breakfast? It's just having a random and casual conversation. Yeah, that's what you actually need to do. So that's first one. Establish the pre-morbid functioning, their occupational history, their patterns, and their routines. Now, establish 
their patterns and routines, establish their previous abilities prior to them coming to see you. What I meant by that is you need to establish, are they a shower person or a bath person? Is the shower, do they shower over the bath? Or if they're a shower person, how often in a week do they shower? If they have a bath, how often in a week do they have a bath? So it's things like that. You need to establish washing and dressing. Are they independent? Were they getting any assistance or were they independent? So it's really important that you establish their baseline function, the things that they do every day. Okay. And if they shower, for example, do they shower standing up or sitting down? Things like that. The other thing that you need to do, so that's one, establishing who they are. Yeah. The next thing you need to do is establish their environment, meaning do they live in a house? Is it a bungalow? If they live in a house, where is the bedroom? Is it upstairs? Is it downstairs? Where are the toilets? Is it upstairs? Is it downstairs? If they have stairs, it's good to know where is the rail? Are the rails, are there rails on both sides or just one going up? I meant rail on the right going up or is it on the left going up and uh, uh, find out if they have a shower facility or if the shower facility is uh, located over the bath or they have a walk-in shower or they have a wet room. There are two things you've established on the baseline, their routines and habits and their abilities prior to coming to see you. The next thing is you established their environmental setup yeah and then the next thing is you need to establish their equipment the equipment the adaptive aids that is available to them or that they have so the common things that you normally would order as an occupational therapist do they have a walking stick do they have a walking frame do they have a three-wheeled walker if it is so if they were walking, were they independent? Did they use a stick or not? Have that casual conversation. Do they own a wheelchair? Yeah. If they're walking outside or if they're having difficulty walking outside, do they use electric scooter? Do they own a commode? If they have difficulty and you can see that prior to being in the hospital, they have difficulty with stairs, ask them how they do it. Do they use the rail? Are they reliant on the rail? Do they use a stair lift? If they have a shower facilities, do they have rails? Um, do they have shower over the bath or do they sit down or is there a bath lift? Do they have carers? All the equipment, perching stools, where are they? How many? Bed lever, do they have it? Where is it? Is it on the right side, on the left side? Is it on both sides? So it's things like that. It's, all, it's good to have an overall picture of the person because this will be your guide in the future when you try to set up uh, your goals. When you start making goals, then you will be using this baseline information. Yeah, Technically, you won't be able to aim for something that is beyond their baseline abilities. After that, you've established their baseline through interview. If they're not reliable, you'll have to ask family members who are reliable. Yeah, You don't just rely on the notes because people will do that. There will be people that will establish different stories from nurses, from doctors, from physios. You would get all of this information. A lot of people will try and obtain this information. But it depends whether you trust the team members or not. And sometimes as an occupational therapist, I know for a fact that we are very thorough with the information because this is our job. We look after our patients and we look after, we are, we're more thorough when establishing the baseline abilities of the patients because this is what we do. Okay, so after establishing the baseline function of the patient, okay, what you need to do next is you need to establish their current abilities, yeah? So now you will compare uh, their baseline and their current abilities. And I would recommend that you use a formal outcome measure for this. There is FIM-FAM uh, where you can do that, uh, but it's not a commonly used outcome measure in the United Kingdom. There is Barthel Index, but again, there are limits to that. 
And uh, for me personally, I've developed an outcome measure and I called it the CARE measure or the Cambridge ADL rehab measure, which I will be discussing with you at some point and in the future. Um, but yes, you have that. So establish the baseline. The next thing you need to do is establish their current abilities and you would want to establish and compare that to their baseline. Yeah. Can they wash? Can they dress? Can they, can they walk? Things like that. You need to compare it. What if, for example, they use the bath and in the hospital, they're not yet bathing. You have to have an analysis of the person. You need to gauge if the person has to have a bath, then in there, would you want them bathing? Would you not want them bathing? If they need to ba bathe, do they need assistance of one person or two people? Or they shouldn't do that. Uh, or it has to be a special nurse that has to do those things. And if they are, for example, so tied up or connected to lots of adaptive aids, or I meant uh, infusion and lines, say, for example, they have lines or they have like IV lines, for example. If they were independent with dressing for the time being, should they dress? Would they be independent or would they need a little help? So with the IV lines, I think you'd need an assistance of one person because you have to get the arms, you need to manage all of, you have to manage to get the arm through the, the sleeves. So you have to establish that, establish their current abilities, yeah? Now you have established their baseline abilities. The next thing is you establish the current abilities. And then the next thing you need to do now as an occupational therapist would be to actually analyze whether what's the cause of the limitation. You need to establish the cause of their impairment. So impairment being functional impairment. What's the reason why they are performing the way they are performing? And how do you establish this? You need to establish is the reason why they're not washing and dressing or they're not walking. Is it because of a physical reason? Are they weak? Are they generally deconditioned? The next thing is the reason why they're not doing it is because of a cognitive reason that they are confused, they're agitated, they're delirious. So that's a cognitive reason. Was the reason why they're not doing it, was it because of affective reason or their emotional state? Or be, are they depressed or their motivation is lacking? Or was the reason because of a contextual nature? like? being acutely ill, for example, and the person is, say, connected to lots of lines. So these are contextual situations. And context meaning you can't do much about it. You have to work around the context. You have to live around or work around the context. So that is phase one, guys. Yeah. So establish the pre-morbid functioning, roles and habits and interests, find out what they are. You need to establish their current abilities. You need to compare that. And then you need to come up with a, you need to understand and analyze the cause of their problem. Okay. Through analysis. So that's phase one. The next stage is phase two, which is problem identification and goal setting. Now, why did I think that this is an important phase? I know this to be an important phase because sometimes occupational therapy session can happen just by doing this and this alone. Sometimes you just sit down and plan it with the person and you discuss what needs to be done. You need to spend some time finding out what you need to do because this is not purely your game you know you are doing this alongside your patient and it's a collaborative work so you need to find out uh, what you need to plan this with them okay so on the phase two they, these are there are things that you needed to do right and this is particularly if you're working in the hospital so what are these so the first one you need to establish Okay, you need to set up a, the functional requirement, the baseline target that you need to get this person out of your care. 
at the onset, you start planning about discharge. So what would be the functional requirement needed for this person to be discharged home? So you remember, you establish the problem on the phase one, you analyze the problem as well. And then the next thing is now you know what their ability is on phase one. Then the next thing is say, for example, uh, getting out of bed, assistance of one person, walking, assistance of one person, going to the toilet, assistance of one person. Yeah. So that is their baseline abilities. Now, the next thing you need to do is because you knew about the home environment, the setup, the social support, their previous ability, now you can start thinking about, okay, what would be a realistic target for us to get this person out of the hospital, okay? That means you have to come up with the outcome expectation. And what are these outcome expectations? Are you discharging a person? Are you setting it so that the person is, is going to be independent? Are you aiming for the person to be safe? Or are you aiming for the person to be supported or some preventative goals, for example? So how do we do that? For example, you can start aiming, say, with bed transfers. The person needed assistance of one to begin with, okay? And then by exploring the context and the situation and the condition, you need to find out, am I happy or do you think you can get the person out of bed independently? And this now calls for the skill of the therapist because you can't purely aim for independence. You can never aim all the time for independence. So when you're setting goals, you don't necessarily aim for independence. Okay, so say independence is not achievable. What about can this person be able, can this person get out of bed with a standby assist? Okay, probably you can aim for that. Can this person then do, um, can get out supported with assistance of one? That's a possible goal as well. You can do that because you know that after understanding the condition, you can have a functional prognosis. You can prognosticate their functional abilities. Particularly, say, for example, you have conditions like stroke, elderly person, then yes, you can aim for them to be able to get out of bed with assistance of one person. That's okay. That's realistic, okay? So there you go. So you have problem identification and you have uh, goal setting as well along with problem identification. Now we are on the third phase. So what is on the third phase? The third phase is now the phase of intervention. You are now doing treatment, okay? And when I say treatment, you need to do hands-on. You need to be hands-on when you are treating your patient. It's not just discharge planning and then just giving it to an assistant and then already you set up the cares. Perhaps, perhaps, okay? But treatment is treatment, intervention, okay? And you need to plan your intervention. How do you do that? So with intervention, there are a few things that you need to factor in. When you're treating a person, you need to know how much time you are allowed to work with this person. And time is something that you do not necessarily dictate yourself. Yeah, this is where, this is why the goal setting becomes flawed when you're doing a SMART goal. Because with SMART, you go and do, the person will be able to get out of bed in, in two weeks time or in five days so you can do that. That's difficult to do unless you are a mature clinician, on which case you can anticipate when they will achieve their functional targets. So time sometimes is given to you by the place where you work. So for example, when once the person is medically optimized or sometimes you're only allowed to work with a person for say, 
you're only allowed to work with a person for six weeks. There you go. So that's time. Okay. So time is a factor because once you know how much time you're allowed to work with a person, you can then think of the type of intervention that you would be doing with the person. Okay. So what are these type of intervention? Ramps. If you remember the ecology of human performance model, which would be on some of our previous episodes. Okay. What's, what are ramps? So you can do restorative intervention. So for example, if the person is getting out of bed, restorative intervention, meaning you need to practice uh, with the person so that the person can uh, practice getting out of bed. So that's functional mobility retraining. So you can do dress, dressing practice. So that is, again, restorative intervention. You can do a direct toilet hygiene retraining. This is also a, 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 a restorative intervention. Yeah, If they are weak, then you have to do some strengthening activities. If their endurance is low, you need to do some endurance training or activity tolerance retraining. Yeah, there you go. Restorative intervention. You can have an intervention such as maintain and preventative intervention. So you can aim for a person to just practice over and over if they're with you in, the, in say, in the hospital so that they don't deteriorate, particularly for those people who are waiting to go home. But if you leave them alone, then they would, they're likely to deteriorate. So you can aim for that, okay? The next thing is you need to think about Modify intervention, you can have preventative intervention and create and support intervention, meaning you may consider having carers. If that's the intervention that you want, it's a supportive intervention, that is okay as well because it is factored in on the time that you are allowed to work with the patient. And then you do this over and do it review, do a review every day up until when you can aim for the person to be discharged. Now, if you're progressing towards your outcome, then good. If not, you may have to modify your approach. Yeah, From restorative intervention, you may have to think about supportive intervention, meaning having carers in, right? Okay. Now, the last phase would be discharge. Once you have seen the person and you've completed and you've achieved the outcomes, you just need to document it. Were they independent? Are they safe? Is it are, are problems being, have problems been prevented or are they actually supported? So these are the discharge phase, which means you just have to close that note. You have to make sure that everything that you have set at the beginning is actually closed and you have to sign it. You have to make sure, like, for example, if you aim for the person to be safe, getting out of bed and then on discharge, yes, patient will be safe if you've set the carers in place. If you put the carers in place, then yes, they can be discharged home. Or if the person at the beginning was dependent with toilet hygiene and prior to discharge, you want them to be independent, then you have to put that in place as well. So every time you have to review their abilities as occupational therapist, you look after their uh, occupational uh, baseline, their functional abilities. Okay, there you go, guys. Those are the four phases of occupational therapy involvement or the process that I see. Four phase being the assessment phase, problem identification goal and discharge planning phase, intervention phase, and the last would be closing and the discharge phase. All right. Okay. I hope you learned a little something today just to let you know if you enjoyed this, pass this on to your friends, start talking about it, teach each other, have this conversation, try this, start talking about this and be mindful of your input and your activities because at the end of the day, as students and as clinicians, you will have to pass this on to other therapists when you become educators in the future if you are a student and then, then you become an educator or as clinicians yes you have to be able to verbalize these things perhaps you know that you're already doing it but you don't know that you're doing it which is really interesting okay once again 
thank you for listening. Thank you for paying attention to these conversations. Until next time, guys. Bye.